What's up everybody? I'm Colton the Mini Painter and today we're going to be going over all the weird lingo that comes with miniature painting. Let's get started. So whenever I first got started a painting about four years ago, I began in a very similar place to where you probably are right now. I was Googling everything I could to try to figure out like how to basically paint better minis, you know, get those really smooth velvety blends and then also, you know, get those really sweet, sexy bases, you know. I would read forums, blog posts, watch YouTube videos, all with the end goal of trying to get, obviously, to paint a better mini. During this time, I ran into several terms that are pretty unique, I think, to the miniature painting world, or at least so I thought. With that being said, I'm going to go over seven terms and topics that I wish had been explained to me whenever I first started miniature painting. Here we go. Whenever I was first deciding I wanted to really push the bounds of what I could do in miniature painting, the first thing I really found was zenithal highlighting. It's pretty easy to do. All you do is you take a mini, prime it black, and then you take an off-white color such as bone white from Vallejo that I commonly use or Ushabity bone from Citadel and then you spray it at a 45 degree angle. You can also use other cold off-white colors like Administratum Gray or Sky Blue from Vallejo as well. After you get that first initial 45 degree angle spray then you want to take just pure white and spray it straight down right on top of your miniature. This leaves you with a nice pre-highlighted area that really sets the foundation for some really velvety clean blends in the long run. This technique can also be used with two different rattle cans if you don't have an airbrush. Essentially all you do is, again, prime your model black and then take a off-white and then spray it at a 45 degree angle, very lightly of course, and then take white and spray it straight down. Now, I'm not the one who came up with this, that guy is right here. So go visit his video, he's a great guy. Uh, I haven't met him personally, but I don't want to take credit for something that he did. Now. This topic of blending and setting the foundations of blending gets us to probably the part of this video you have all been waiting for. Thermal, please. Blending. Glazing, wet blending, two brush wet blending, void blending, loaded brush blending, and layering? All of these words have to do with one thing, and that is to get a simple color transition from one color to another color without any clear divisions between the colors, as you can see here. Each of the phrases above is a technique in its own right, and so I won't be covering every one of them in this video, but I will cover the method that I most commonly use, which is layering. I am a layer. Layering actually takes the most time out of all of the above blending techniques because you have to wait until that layer that you, of paint that you just put down is completely dry until you put on a new layer. That can take a long time. Some people, to speed this up, they like to use a hair dryer and dry it out. I personally don't usually do that. The layers I work with are so thin. Usually they dry like by the time I'm ready, and especially if your area is larger, by the time you get done putting that whole layer down across the surface, usually the other side's already dry. Our paints are acrylic, so they usually dry pretty fast, and it's not a big deal. The reason I use layering is because I think that it gives you the most control over your blend compared to the above techniques, all of which except glazing, which I will go over here in a moment. Essentially, the way layering works is you lay down your base coat and then your other color, that you want to work towards. Uh, you don't have to do that, but usually I do. And then what you do is you essentially mix the two paints on your palette, make a mid-tone, and then from there you mix the you mix it like your mid-tone with your shade, which is your darker color, and then you mix your mid-tone with your highlight, and then you get that, that middle, the two new mid-tones essentially between the two, and then you layer them over, and then you do it again, and then you do it again, and then you do it again, and then you do it both ways. And eventually what happens is you build up enough layers to where eventually the colors will blend together. Now, that's where glazing comes in. Now, you may have posted on a forum sometime about, like, what do I do with this miniature? Like, how do I make these blends better? What do I do? And the guy's response was, or, or lady, who knows, <clears throat> something like this. Just glaze it out, bruh. And essentially you had no idea what that was, but you're like, I don't want to look like an idiot, so sure, I'll glaze it. What glazing is, is essentially you take thin down paint, even more so than the layers that you're already doing, and you put, a, you essentially take that mid-tone that you created, or mid-tone that you're using, sometimes people start with their mid-tone, and you thin it out enough to where it'll barely make any difference at all, and then you place it across the entire area of your blend. What that does is it brings in all of the highlights and all the shadows and the mid-tones, it brings everything together just a little bit, and usually what that does is that'll help blend out any type of uh, visible transitions that you can see. 
Some people that are really, really good at this can almost get it to where the blends are completely invisible. One thing to note about blending is it's almost impossible to get a 100% perfect blend. So one of the most common terms that I ran into whenever I was like diving into the deep annals of the interwebs, it didn't really have anything to do with miniature painting at all. It really had more to do with basing and that sort of thing. And that is PVA glue, or at least that's what I think it's called in Britain. Here in the United States, it's pretty much just called Elmer's glue, or at least that's the type you want to use. If that information alone isn't worth your review, I don't know what is. It took me forever to figure out that PVA glue was also Elmer's glue here in the U.S. Go figure. So PVA glue, or polyvinyl acetate as it is called, is actually a category of glues in and of itself. We typically use it to glue down things like sand, baking soda, rocks, stuff like that to our bases. It's relatively easy to use and super cheap, especially compared to a lot of the miniature stuff that we have to buy, and so that's why it's so commonly used today. The two other types of glue I want to talk about today are plastic glue and then just normal super glue. Plastic glue and super glue sounds like the same thing, right? It's actually not. Plastic glue or plastic cement, as it is commonly called, is a, is a category of glues that fixes two pieces of plastic together by melting the two pieces of plastic and then essentially welding them together. Now, Citadel sells their own version of it simply called plastic glue. Be very careful whenever using plastic glue because if you do get it on like the face of a model, the model's gone. Uh, there's not a lot you can do with it. It will actively melt that plastic, like I said before, so not much you can really do about that. The third type of glue I want to talk about is, of course, super glue. Super glue is a little bit different from plastic glue. It is not going to melt your miniatures. Super glue is different from plastic glue in that it essentially just forms a resin structure in between the two pieces of plastic. Now, this structure starts to be formed in the presence of water. Presence of water. That's a big deal. Here's why. If you accidentally pour a little bit of super glue on that part of your model that you don't want super glue to be, don't use water to wash it off. It's going to immediately cause it to harden and then you will probably never get it off. My recommendation for this is to simply take like a toothpick, maybe a used brush or something like that, and just have it on hand so that way if that does happen, especially while you're building miniatures, you can just scrape it right off. Problem solved and you can go on about your day. If you spent any time at all miniature painting, somewhere along the way, you are going to come across this term called contrast. If you're getting just getting into the hobby, you will have probably heard this term in reference to what is known as contrast paint, which is actually a product that Games Workshop makes. It's very good for especially beginner players and getting an entire army done in a short amount of time without having to worry too much about thinning their paints and worrying about getting things like brush strokes, clog details, things like that. Contrast kind of prevents that from happening. We'll go more into contrast paints in a later video and all of the different things that they can be used for, but for now, just suffice it to say, contrast paint is a useful way for beginner, for beginner miniature painters to get started. Contrast as a concept is referring to the difference in either color or tone in one area of a miniature versus another, like you can see on this model here. As many painters, we have to increase the contrast on our miniatures past its normal levels because our models are so small. If these models were life-size, then theoretically we could just base coat them and they would look fine. Contrast can sometimes be hard to achieve in a way that doesn't look gaudy, and typically the best way for beginners is to do the Games Workshop way of simply base coating, shading the recesses, and then edge highlighting the model like what you would see in a Space Marine. Now, now sometimes that won't work for things like cloth, but it'll, it'll get you past that beginning step. Past that point, you're going to quickly move into topics such as blending or zenithal highlighting that we've already covered before and we'll be sure to go into more depth with in later videos. So this one is kind of funny. Whenever I first started painting, I had no idea what these were called. I thought they were stickers, but apparently they're called decals or decals depending on where you're from. And so there you have it. That's what they're actually called. Decals or decals depending on where you're from, whatever works best for you. Tomato, tomato. Now, as you apply these, I personally recommend using Micro Saw and Micro Set. It really makes this easier, especially if you're doing it on a rounded surface like the Space Marine shoulder pad. And I'll be sure to put the link in the description down below for those products on Amazon, so that way you guys can go pick them up. They're pretty cheap. In order to use these, in short, all you're going to have to do is cover the area you want to apply the decal to with Micro Set. And then once it's dried, put the decal on after soaking it in water, of course, to get it to come off the paper. After that, apply Microsol to the decal, allow it to sit for several seconds, and then take some tissue paper or cloth and apply slight pressure to the bubbles. You'll have to repeat this process several times if you're doing something like a shoulder pad. 
Also be careful not to tear the decal as the micro saw is actually melting it. After that's done, you'll want to apply some form of varnish to the area, which brings us to the next topic of varnish. Varnishing encompasses several purposes, and there's hundreds of products out there for each of those purposes. Products like GW's Minutorm Varnish, if I said that right, or Vallejo Matte Varnish, like what I have here. Varnishing can be used for things simply as protecting your miniature, or it can be used to create a safe spot in a complicated freehand that you might have to come back to later. Varnishing can also be used to add really cool effects like wet teeth, like you can see my friend Sophia did right here in her video. Varnishing can be applied either by brush or by airbrush or by aerosol if that's what you have. The three main categories of varnish are gloss varnish, satin varnish, and then matte varnish. Matte varnish that you can see right there. Gloss varnish is the best of the three for protecting your models as it creates the hardest coat over your models once it dries. Now, if you do this to your model, say like a Space Marine, you may not want that glossy coat, so simply just go over it again with matte varnish to dull it back down. If you do this, be careful because that matte varnish will actually knock the shine out of all your metals. So if you're going to do this, what I would recommend doing is paint all the non-metallic surfaces up to completion. And then after that, I would recommend going ahead and then finishing out all the metal surfaces. Don't worry though, if you've already done that, that's fine. Go back over the metal surfaces after you've already applied the matte varnish with more gloss varnish and it should bring back most of the shine of the metal. So getting more specifically into matte varnish, I find that I like matte varnish a lot better over a finished model because I think the matted down look really brings out a more realistic tone towards the model. The reason for this is the more satin finish that I see from the paints that we typically use makes the model look a little bit more like a toy and less like a realistic piece of art. Satin varnish is simply the middleman between the two, and I don't use it a whole lot, simply because I don't really like the finish that it gives. So this last one is something that I actually found on DakaDaka.com whenever I first started using, or whenever I first started painting miniatures, and it involves a miniature painting competition that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, but at the time I sure wasn't, and that is called the Golden Demon. Imagine that there is this little thing that we all paint and spend hours of our lives doing in order to get this little award that, that you get bragging rights for life. Couldn't imagine anyone would do that, right? Well, that's what we miniature painters do, because that's essentially what the Golden Demon is, but it is probably one of the most competitive miniature painting competitions out there in general. It is specific to Warhammer 40k and Age of Sigmar and all of Games Workshop's products, but that being said, it has garnered a lot of attention over the years in our community, and so it's something that you probably have heard of and may not be aware of if you're just getting started, but that's what it is. Similar competitions are something like Crystal Brush or the Gen Con painting competition that I've been to a few times. And so those are and so those are some miniature painting competitions that you may have heard of. There aren't a lot of miniature comp painting competitions here in the States, and so sometimes you can find some stuff online in order to compete in. Alright guys, and so that is it for this video. I hope you guys learned a lot. And if you guys have any questions about topics I did or didn't cover, drop a comment down below or shoot me an email at minipainter001 at yahoo.com. I'd be happy to help you guys out. If you guys would like, I would love to uh, feature your work here on this channel as well. So if there's a mini that you've painted that you'd love to see featured here, hey, drop me an email, let me know that you'd like me to share, and I'd love to put it up here at the end of the video and talk about it. Anyway, I hope you guys had a nice day, roll the hard six, and keep on painting. See you guys next time. Bye.